Well, good evening. This is Bishop Spears again, and I know I always say that, but I really enjoy uh, welcoming you to our time of sharing. It's, it's always amazing uh, to see what God is doing and to hear him speak. Um, it's just so refreshing that the word of God is so powerful, uh, particularly in this season, and then it's so relevant and it's just a relevant word there's no way any of us can pre-plan what God is doing and what God is going to say uh, but when we hear his voice uh, we want to make sure that we we follow through on every prompting of what God will say to us and through us uh, in this season so I want to ask you if you will to bow with me for a word of prayer and then we're going to get started. Father God, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, uh, for who you are and for what you mean to us. We just give you glory and honor, Lord, and thank you so much, Father, for this opportunity to share your word. I pray and I ask, Lord, that you will allow this word to come alive in my mind, in my heart, and in my spirit. Allow my voice to be clear that God, even as I teach your word, that God, your word will penetrate our hearts. And if we do no more than take a look at our lives, then we will have accomplished everything I believe that you have set out for us to do. Father, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We love on you and we thank you in advance for what we believe in faith you're going to do. It is in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Amen. So listen, let me get started. I can't start, however, tonight uh, without recognizing three individuals and uh, probably four uh, young ladies that are growing up in our church and uh, somewhere through the course of this day and uh, this week and weeks past, I've heard from them. And so I just want to say, give a shout out today to Little Sister Miracle. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I was preparing to get ready for tonight. and I had this message on my phone that says, hello, it's Miracle. And uh, it re really blessed my heart. And I just started thinking. And so I told her, I said, I'm going to give you a shout out tonight. When I started thinking about Miracle, I started thinking about uh, little sister Mackenzie, who is uh, just a great doll. And I really love and appreciate. And of course, little Vanessa. So I uh, celebrate those individuals. Every Sunday morning at that eight o'clock worship, I was guaranteed at least three godly hugs from uh, beautiful gems that are part of our ministry. Sister Miracle, Sister Little, Sister Mackenzie, and Sister Vanessa. And so I pray that their parents or grandparents will help them to hear this word and to receive this word, uh, that it's a shout out from Bishop and there's so many more. Uh, little Brother Eli, Lord have mercy, He's been helping me preach on Sundays, and I am so thankful uh, for the children. You know, God will put a word in the mouth of children that will bless the body of Christ, and they have no idea how they have encouraged me uh, during this season, and uh, I want them to know I miss them too. I miss our hugs, and a time of celebration, and then so many others. I was thinking about uh, Sister Marion, uh, Marion's grandson, and I couldn't remember his name, but uh, you know who I'm talking about, just a young brother. Young man would always dress up sharp and suit and tie, and he is the spin image. He just says, he's Bishop Kenneth Spears, and i Man, I give you shout out today and don't charge it to Bishop. It's, it's my head. I can't remember your name, but I'm, you're in my heart and I see a picture of you even as I speak. And so 
I give you shout out today. And Miriam, make sure my buddy understands and knows that Bishop loves him very much. Amen. Secondly, let me encourage you. I was uh, I was praying the other day and uh, the Holy Spirit brought to my attention about the ministry of uh, Brother Kenneth Copeland and uh, the believers uh, of Christ, of victory, and who are going to be in Fort Worth, Texas. And, you know, in the process of praying, the Holy Spirit said to me, uh, pray for them. And I want to make sure that we clearly understand. I know that this is a COVID time, and uh, but let me share with you what I've been praying about. And I've made it personal. I've been praying about good success. You know, what we have to understand, and this word is going to be a blessing for us tonight, that whatever our opinions are of people, uh, even Jesus said, if they are part of us, then we can't fight against them on, on, uh, on account of their belief or their operation. And so I'm praying that in the city of Fort Worth, I'm praying that in Tarrant County, uh, that none of these things that we are experiencing hits or causes anyone to become sick. As a matter of fact, I'm praying healing in the name of Jesus because a win for them is a win for the kingdom of God. There are so many people who are making light of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I'm saying to you as a body of Christ, as believers, uh, that we've got to make sure that we pray. Make that the center of your prayer, that God will use them this week, that his anointing will be fresh upon them, and that the power of the Holy Spirit, people will be healed, set free, and delivered, and that God will build a hedge around this city uh, so that COVID-19 can be broken over our city. It can be broken over this county. And that while believers, Christian believers, are preaching and teaching the word of God, that life-changing messages will go forth that will literally cause the body of Christ to have a win. There's a place, and I get started in the word, where the Apostle Paul says that we have to defend the faith, that there are some causes we champion because people are part of the faith. They are part of the family. They are part of the kingdom of God. They are part of the body of Christ. And so I want to encourage you, let's make sure we do our level best uh, to pray uh, for victory, for success, and that there will be no breakage, no outbreaks, no outbreaks in terms of COVID, but everybody will be healed. As a matter of fact, I'm laying my head tonight on my head and on my, on my belly and on my heart, on my body. And I pray right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, for your healing. I pray that we represent the body of Christ. We represent believers. And I pray and I ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that your anointing, that as I lay my hand on my body, I lay my hand on the body of Christ. As I lay my hand on my body, I lay my hand on believers, oh God, that we will Faith will be stirred up in us and victory will come forth like never before. We declare right now, move every ounce of sickness. We declare that it leaves our body, that we are not bombarded by sickness, but we are healed in the name of Jesus. We declare it to be so and we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to encourage you. I really believe in prayer. We can't be uh, partial or operate with half truth. Either you believe in God or you don't. And so 
uh, any area of sickness you are experiencing, you lay hands on yourself, but allow your hand to represent the hand of God, that even as you pray for yourself, you're praying for the body of Christ, that God will release and that he will send sickness back to the very pits of hell. You got to believe that and we're declaring it, we decree it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to get started tonight. We're looking again at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. And of course, tonight we're looking at verse number 11. Verse 11, the Bible says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires uh, which rage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Verse 13, submit yourselves uh, for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether in the imperial or as the supreme authority or to governors or who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. But it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Verse 16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil, uh, for evil life. Live as God's God slaves. I want you to hang on to that. That's a teaching I want to deal with tonight. Show a proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the imperial. Slaves in reverential fear of God. Submit yourself to your masters and not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up another the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you, you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you as an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Uh, verse 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he trusted or entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Amen and amen. There are different, there are different highlights, uh, particularly in, uh, in the word of God. Uh, remember, we started out, as a matter of fact, um, in 1 Peter, we began to look at uh, how we are to praise God for living, uh, for a living hope. Uh, we transitioned from a living hope to what it meant to be to be holy. And um, we then began to move to that place in chapter two, particularly where the Bible gives that we are the living stone and a chosen people. Uh, it, is, it is interesting what God shares even tonight. We seem to be faced with choices and decisions as believers uh, like no other time ever before, uh, particularly when the text says, 
that we ought to live godly lives in a pagan society. Now, that word is just so remarkable because it really does give us an opportunity because for the last uh, couple of days, both Sunday and Monday, we talked about uh, the miracle of the bread. Uh, the miracle of bread uh, came forth, the manifestation in a place where idolatry uh, seemed to have been the rule. And uh, yet we are now in a place or space as it relates to 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, the word of God shares with us the dynamics in terms of what life looks like when uh, we're in a pagan society or in a worldly like society that is full of worldly ideals and in many cases, worldly people that are in places of leadership. I know I'm right tonight, uh, particularly when uh, we are asked according to the word of God that we are to give honor to, to whom honor is due in relation of uh, human leadership, particularly human leadership that's in authority. And the Bible is explicit. Peter is uh, on point. He says, pay attention to your governors, pay attention to those who are mayors or those individuals who provide leadership in your cities, in your state, and even in your nation. And so the language that Peter uses is somewhat different, but he's speaking to a time and place like where we are today when choices and decisions are being made concerning our lives. And as a matter of fact, we have no real guarantee that the choices and decisions that are being made for our lives are made by people who are praying first. Come on. As a matter of fact, there are some times when it seems like individuals have been more uh, operating in their feeling as opposed to making choices or decisions that reflect the lives of good, honest, godly people. And so it's it always seems like we live in a an economic war because it's always about money. And so when you look at what Paul, uh, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, he speaks primarily saying, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires. I mean, and so let me let me pause and share with this. This language as a foreigner and as an exile. You, looking at uh, in times past when Peter uh, originally addressed the children of God, the body of Christ, remember they are scattered. And there is, in terms of teaching and preaching, uh, a place that Peter is trying with every effort uh, to get God's word to these people, many of whom who are scattered Others who are scattered and hiding because they are afraid to admit that they've been persuaded, they've been influenced, and they've been brought under conviction as it relates to the word of God. And so they are scattered. They are in hiding in many places. And yet Peter takes a bold stand to use the word of God to provide the kind of leadership that says that as Christian believers, there is, there is a way that we ought to conduct ourselves, although we're living in a place and time uh, where as believers, as Christians, we're being hunted down from like the Sanhedrin uh, who has a difficulty in believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in my own words, Peter is saying, I know you're being hunted down. I know that you are up under great obligation to serve and to operate in a capacity 
where you've got to follow the leadership that does not believe in our God. But he says these words, because we are Christians, there's a way that we conduct ourselves like uh, we operate because we want to live for Jesus Christ. And so he says, he says, you are literally in the idea of foreigners and or exiles in this place, but you are still uh, responsible for occupying truth, uh, demonstrating your love for Jesus Christ and operating in a standpoint so that the word of God uh, can can be the leading focus of the penetrating of the part that is exemplified so that when people see you, they see Jesus Christ in your life. Uh, let me let me transition and I think it, it will help you. Uh, when we first started doing the uh, Monday night, Wednesday night, and we started flowing, moving to the operation of uh, teaching uh, the, the text from Sunday sermon on Monday, uh, beginning to pray about uh, which book of the Bible to study uh, from a, a particular place uh, in terms of following the exposition from chapter one, chapter two, verse one through, you know, it is what expository preaching or teaching is all about is looking at the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, and operating in a place where you're trying to really live according to the word of God, which really says that we're not choosing a passage of scripture, that there has to always be uh, some word of encouragement, but there has to be a place of instruction. And of course, I've chosen to make sure that every Wednesday, uh, as we walk through First Peter, when we complete First Peter, we'll move to the next book that the Holy Spirit gives leadership to because we want to be grown up, mature, spiritually mature believers. We don't want to be soft. We don't want uh, to operate from a, a spiritual diabetes because we eat too much sweets. Talk, Bishop. I just interjected that because you know you can have you can have all snacks and and never have pure meat. And remember, Peter says there's a place in time when we come where we move off of milk and we move to meat. So in that in that process, I came across a cousin of mine that I've known for years, who's been chiming in with us. Uh, Morning worship uh, has been a part of our Bible study on Monday, on Wednesday. Uh, in, in our early formative years, she was living in Michigan. She now lives in Tennessee. And when we re began to reconnect, uh, after some time, she asked a question of me that I'm going to address tonight because I think it's a, it's a perfect place as a matter of fact, uh, I had finished teaching one Monday or Tuesday night. And as I'm driving, we began to talk. And she says, cousin, what about what about the word of God when it says something about believers being slaves <laughs> and operating in terms of giving honor to emperors? operating, identifying who masters are, how do we focus, how do we adjust? I thought it was a powerful question. And of course, uh, once I got home, we began to talk about that text. Here's what I really believe, and I really want to encourage you because I believe that every believer has to expand their teaching or their versions in terms of of the word of God. And so I, I want to help you with that. It, it, is, it is amazing that uh, uh, in uh, John Maxwell's Bible, uh, when he talks primarily about those same verses, 
uh, he says there's a word about submission to masters, uh, servants uh, be submissive. So in in the NIV it says slaves be submissive. In John Maxwell that book says uh, servants be submissive. Uh, in the Amplified it says uh, be submissive in every human institution. Um, for, for the role that we play. And I, I want to help us because uh, if you're going to be a uh, if you're going to be a Bible student, if you're going to be a Bible scholar uh, and you're going to really thoroughly examine the word of God, you got to look at the whole matter. And looking at the whole matter is not just operating from a King James version but you've got to look at the different versions. And I would even uh, push you to take a look at the Message Bible uh, because the Message Bible uh, talks about it from a different angle. And, and so I want, to, I want to help us because I believe that what God is really saying, he says that, that not that we are to be slaves, he says there is a kind of commitment that you and I have. So uh, remember when the Bible was written, there was a language that was akin to the time. <laughs> when the Bible was written in its original translation, uh, when those men began to write the word of God, they used language that was available to them. And sometimes that language transitions over depending upon who's inscribing and who's inscripting, you know, uh, from that perspective. And so uh, it, it's a powerful text because uh, what God really says, he says that you've got to obey the authorities, those individuals who are in a place of providing leadership uh, because we are operating in a space and a place and a time where we have to be obedient. You can't just break laws, in other words. You know, there are some laws that have been written that we have to operate inside of, even if we didn't write them, we didn't vote on them, we didn't pass them. But because they are now law, then we've got to operate with them. And then watch this when we began to look at the structural flow in terms of the development of our society, the systems, this world, worldly system that we live inside of has a president of the United States. It has the different cabinets. It has the Congress. It has the Senate. It has uh, representatives. I mean, it is a. Uh, uh, a tier kind of development, uh, structural flow in terms of operation. And so God is saying to us, even though you've been, or since you've been saved, that's a good translation, since you've been saved, since you have become a part of the body of Christ, he says to you and I, you make sure that you operate in terms of this world system so that you model the example of being a Christian. Here's what the word says. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And because we are saved and we are in the world, but not of the world, we still are obligated to follow the rules and operations of this world. Here's what here's the blessing, and I want to help you because I believe that what God is really doing, He's instituting and moving us in our mindset, if we'll let Him, to a kingdom minded operation. Which means, then, in order to really function as a kingdom believer, we operate in a foreign society and watch this. Uh, what what Peter calls it, what the identity uh, that has been given is that it's a society uh, or a world society that has been that is uh, 
dogmatic in its operation, but God is saying, you be the believer that I've called you to be and operate so that he says, and when you do what you do, the world will see you doing good deeds and not just glorify you, but will glorify the father who lives on the inside of you. And so my second trans uh, uh, movement has to do with the amplified version. That's the reason why I always bring different Bibles to this time, because I think that if we're going to really capture and gain the information that God wants us to have, he says, so we are foreigners. Uh, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And because we live in this world, we still have to operate by the rules or the ruling, uh, the authority that is in place in terms of our operation. So listen at these same words I've just read, uh, and I'll go as far as I can tonight. But in that word, the amplified version, verse 11 says, Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles in this world to abstain from sensual urges, evil desires, or the passions of the flesh from your lower nature that wage war against the soul. In other words, he's saying you cannot operate as a believer. As a matter of fact, it has to be your goal. It has to be your ambition to not move and operate from the flesh, but to operate from the spirit. Because if we operate from the flesh, we're going to handle people the way we would in the flesh. But if we operate from the spirit, we're going to make some choices or decisions to do something different from what is natural, what is the natural operation or the natural decision which means uh, Bishop Morton teaches that principle about spirit over the mind. In other words, I'm led by the spirit of God. Even though my mind tells me to do something one way, I've got to follow the lead and the prompting of the Holy Spirit so that I react and I respond based upon the spirit and not upon the flesh. And so he says, those passions of the flesh, your Lord nature, they wage war against the soul. Lord have mercy. Where our soul has been rescued from the error of our way. Our soul has been redeemed. Our soul has been covered by the blood of Jesus. And so God is saying, as we grow, say that with me, as we grow, because the truth of the matter is, uh, the average person that is coming into the Christian life, the Christian family, or the Christian community, it there is a process to begin to walk in this way. You don't become spiritually mature overnight. And so Peter says, at least have a goal or an ambition that you are walking or working towards because you're trying to live out a spiritual experience and not continue in a fleshly experience. That's all he really says. He says, verse 12, conduct yourselves properly, honorably, righteously among the Gentiles so that although they may slander you as evildoers, yet they may be, they may by witnessing your good deeds come to you, glorify God in the day of inspection when God shall look upon you wanderers as a pastor or a shepherd looks upon his sheep. Now that's an amazing, that's amazing application from a real place because what it says is even in the life, if God is operating as a pastor, then God is using the illustration that there is a pastoral inspection and there is a shepherd inspection that a pastor has in terms of inspecting fruit or inspecting people. So 
uh, he says, from a spiritual place, you ought to be able to discern as a pastor, you ought to be able to discern the nature, the character, the conduct of people. And you ought to be able to see the manifestation of their growth and their development. Uh, with, so nobody's judging you. We're just inspecting and we are operating from a God perspective. He says, conduct yourselves properly. Man, I'm still rejoicing from I taught on Monday about uh, Demi Wright, uh, her reaction to how she was treated at that Walmart or Target or whatever that store was going jogging. I kept saying trotting, but she was jogging to see about a bike. And I'm still praying for a release, for a bike to be released from heaven because of her response or how she reacted. She didn't fly off the handle. And I get it because the truth of the matter is there are moments and times when we do well of not flying off the handle. But the truth of the matter is, Lord, sometimes we call it that weak moment and off the handle we go. I mean, you know, and so God understands that there are sometimes, here it is, the Bible says it best, when I would do good, evil is always present. I can make up my mind that I'm going to jog and I'm going to do right and I'm going to be right toward people. But the moment I determine that I, I'm going to be right, that enemy get, begins to set traps. And you know what? Even as I'm teaching this word tonight, you got to know that the enemy will set traps for me. I'm re Here I am releasing your word that is to help all of us grow. I'm releasing the word in terms of our conduct operating in a society that is worldly, that has worldly ideas. And I'm saying to you as a believer, there is a conduct, there is a character, there is a way that we ought to carry ourselves as believers. And so pray for me, because <laughs> as I'm releasing this word, the enemy can set traps and I need God to guide me around every trap that the enemy puts in my path because I too want to live out what is right, what is righteous, what is holy before the Lord. I said, I want to. Yes, I do. I want to do that. And so God is saying, he says, conduct yourselves properly. Be honorable, righteously among the Gentiles so that although they may slander you as evildoers, yet they may by witnessing your good deeds come to glorify God in the day of inspection so that when God shall look upon you, you wanderers as a pastor or shepherd looks over his flock. Verse 13, be submissive to every human institution and authority for the sake of the Lord, whether it be uh, to the emperor or as a supreme. Now that word, we don't have emperors in this society. Uh, what we have, however, we have uh, presidents. We have uh, our language in terms of rulers of authority. We have governors. We have mayors. You know, we have police officers. We have all of these things that are authority institutions. As a matter of fact, if we be right about it, there is an a, a, a institution of authority that operates even in the kingdom of God, even in the body of Christ. That's the reason why, you know, the Bible says be respectful of authority, be submissive to authority. Don't just get out of line in terms of even with your pastor. And I know I got some people that are online tonight that may not be members of First St. John Cathedral. But be, be sensitive to the role and how you handle those persons that are in places of leadership. For God's sake, in this season, you've got to be careful how you handle principals and teachers and how you handle administrators. For God's sake, you've got to be careful how you handle people who are providing leadership in all of these areas of institution. So why not follow the rules and regulations 
of the national or the international CDC of our nation as it relates to making sure that we take care of ourselves. Put your mask on. Uh, make sure that you are sanitizing your hand. Make sure that you operate six feet from uh, other people so that you can be healthy. I mean, make the choice and the decision to live like we've got to live for some time so that we are able to take care of ourselves. Do what you're supposed to do. Make sure you are protecting yourself. And this is a good word you need to have with your children, your teenagers, your youth, your young adults. I mean, got to have with them because there are young people who still want to live their life and do whatever. But you better make sure you understand that this COVID-19 is not partial in terms of what race you are part of, whether you are wealthy or poor. Uh, we are all on the same line, whether you, whether you are educated or uneducated. You've got to do your level best to make sure from a health pers healthy perspective, we're doing everything to keep ourselves safe. And the Bible gives this word, verse 14, or to governors. Uh, as sent by him to bring vig uh, vengeance, punishment, justice. And here's the thing we've got to understand. There is nothing happening in America. There is absolutely nothing that is going on in the world today that God doesn't know about. Here's the truth. There are some people who are in places of leadership we absolutely disagree with the way they talk to us, how they handle us, but they are in the spot. Watch this. So even if you disrespect the person, you got to respect the position. Did you ever notice how frustrated, how fired up we became? Many people in the body of Christ or in the African-American community when President Barack Obama is giving a un, uh, State of the Union address and someone shouts from the audience, you are lying. We, that place almost became dismantled. You know, it was interrupted. Even in the day and time when President Bush was uh, serving and got through the shoe, and, oh, come on, there's a disrespect. And there is an honor that we have to, and we can't honor just because we're in the same race. We can't honor people because we're in the same economic status. We can't honor people because we're on the same educational plane. We've got to honor people because it's just right to do. You say what you want, but man, it's a, we as adults respect we applaud and we appreciate young people that today still say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. You know I'm telling the truth. There is something about the child that appreciates or honors adults, no matter who they are, that you, they are able to give them that godly respect. And, and you know, we kind of look at kids or children strange if they just say, yeah. Yes. What? You know, you got, yeah. You might want to pull them pants up. You might want to put some, I'm going to have to wash your mouth out with some soap, you know. I'm going to have to do something to you. You know, put these bees on you, you know. <laughs> it, it, all of that stuff comes out of us when we have children to disrespect us, but they get it from somewhere. And we've got to make sure we're modeling it in our homes, but we're training up our children in the way that they should go so that when they're older, they will not depart from it. Verse 15, the Bible says, for it is God's will and intention that by doing right, your good and honest lives should silence, muzzle, gag the ignorant charges of ill-informed criticism of foolish persons. I opened this talk tonight by saying that I wanted us to pray uh, that Kenneth Copeland, uh, Bill Winston, Creflo Dollar, 
Jerris Avell, all of these team of people who are operating from a faith perspective. And watch this. There are a lot of people who will take on the role of verse number uh, 16 or verse number 15, and they will have ignorant conversations and they'll make uh, statements that are deplorable uh, because they don't believe in God that way. They will make comments because they don't believe in this faith perspective. And you, we got to be careful because as believers, we too can be guilty of saying something. And when I hear the word of God, the, the Bible says the disciples were saying to Jesus, as a matter of fact, here's what they said. They said, there's some people over there that are carrying on. And they're calling out people in your name. They're not with us. They don't walk with us. They're not operating with us. And Jesus says to them, he says, if they're not against us, they are with us. And that's all I'm saying. You may have your own personal opinions about having a religious conference, a faith believers conference in downtown Fort Worth, in Tarrant County, and you may have your own opinion about what they should or should not be doing. But can I encourage you? We need a win for God. We need a godly win for God. We need to make sure without within, within every capacity that we are praying that no one is sick no one gets sick. Anybody that is sick will get healed. That will be set free and delivered. We got, I mean, come on, take the high road on that. Begin to pray because we need miracles. We need the manifestation of miracles. And we need to know in the body of Christ, in this foreign land, that uh, we that even though we are foreigners because we are a part of the body of Christ and we are part of the family of God and we live in this world, but we're not of the world. We need God to have a check in the wind column. As a matter of fact, we need to begin to see and hear about miracles that are taking place. Listen, these words that are being performed and manifest in first Kings, second Kings, about miracles that are taking place, you, you and I have to still believe that God is able to take poison and that is bitter and make it sweet. We have to believe that God, through the aid of the Holy Spirit, is still able to create a moment so that uh, creditors will not take our houses and take our properties because God is providing for us. Come on, you ought to be shouting that we that the miracles that we read about in the word of God, that God who is able to heal the sick and raise the dead, give sight to the blind, cause the lame to be able to walk. We've got to believe that God is still able. He's still able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond anything you or I could ever imagine. As a matter of fact, you need a miracle in your house today. You need God to release a miracle. You need God to put a surprise on your table. You need God to put a surprise in your house and do something because the moment God manifests a miracle in your life, nobody should be able to make you be quiet about it. And so we need a we need we need a miracle. We need a win. We need a win. I'm praying right now, Lord, I just bless you in the name of Jesus that nobody gets sick. Nobody that put a hedge around us. God, when it's all over, we win, God. We win, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, we do. Oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. So verse 16, the Bible says, live as free people yet without employing your freedom as a pretext for wickedness, but live at all times as a servant of God. Man, now that word is so powerful. Don't be pretentious. If you're a Christian believer, live it out. 
Don't be just a Christian on Sunday. That's the reason why I'm saying to us, stop saying I'm going to lay my religion down. You, well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to lay it down? You didn't pick it up. What we did was we got it. We got salvation because we connected to God and the Holy Spirit created the avenue for us to be connected to God, to the Father, the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. You didn't pick it up. God rescued you and I from the error of our way. He covered us with his blood. How are we going to lay it down? And why would you want to lay it down? The moment the Bible says in 1 Samuel, there's a word that I preach, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, when you get a chance, read that text. It is powerful because it says in verse 12 that the children of Israel got to Mizpah and they relaxed. They had just won a victory. They had just been given victory over a battle. So rather than maintaining their weaponry in their hand, they laid their weapons down and they began to celebrate. And while they were celebrating, the Bible says the Philistines determined that while they are celebrating, let's attack them. They no longer hold their weaponry. They have laid their weapons down. Let's attack them. The miracle was that God was able to bring them out even with the weapons down. That's the truth. But here's what I'm saying. Who would want to take a chance <laughs> of laying your religion down or your relationship with God down at a place in time when the enemy is so cunning, so swift, so able to penetrate with our imagination. Who would want to lay your weapon down and be unprotected? Who would want to lay their religion down and be unprotected? Who would want to lay their relationship down with Jesus Christ and be unprotected? Not I. <laughs> I want God's protection and everything that I I have that God has given me. I want to use it for his glory. That's the reason why the Bible says that praise is our weapon. We cannot afford to lay praise down. Prayer is a weapon. We can't afford to lay pr our prayer down. So we've got to be found praising God. We've got to be found praying to God all of our life. We cannot afford to lay our weapons down, not when we are in a space and place where the enemy is so cunning and so crafty, so sneaky and so tricky. God is saying you better make sure that you hold on to him and you hold on to his word, that you hold on to your praise, you hold on to your prayer, but you also you better hold on to God and the people. There's some people that God has placed in your life. They are there to help shield and protect you. And in this season, you got to have real believers that will tell you the truth. That's all I'm really trying to do, I'm trying to tell you the truth. Because the Bible says we, as we live as free people, yet without employing your freedom as a pretext for wickedness, but live at all times as a servant of God. Show respect for all men. Treat them honorably. Love the brotherhood, the Christian fraternity of which Christ is the head. Ooh, Jesus, I felt a sound in my voice shifting. Lord, have mercy. A reverence for God that honors him. Lord, have mercy. And verse 18, the Bible says, you who are household servants, be submissive to your masters. That's it. That's the word that was such a deterrent in terms of master, which means that God has to be the master of our life. A few weeks ago, I used that term about a master prophet. And I used that term based upon an individual, uh, male or female, who is operating with the spiritual gift of prophetic or prophecy that is flowing in the apostolic, that is operating in the fivefold 
that when God brings you to a place, as a matter of fact, in terms of the level of your teaching, that what God does is he places us among people that will help to teach us. Uh, I tried. I really did. When I was younger, coming up uh, on, on Miller Street at the corner of Miller, Miller and Raymond, as a matter of fact, they had a barber shop. Uh, that where I used to get my hair cut, uh, Miss Odessa, some of y'all remember her. Uh, they had Mr. Harvey Carey, who had an a awesome record shop, you know, record shop where you, the 48, the 20, all, you know, the, the record shop, the whole nine. But they had a karate place, Lord have mercy. And so I decided I was going to take karate, Lord have mercy. I didn't really realize you can't play with that stuff. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> You can't go in there talking about, you know, you want to be karate kid. <laughs> wax on, wax off. No, no, no. <laughs> so here I go. I go in there. I done secured my uniform. You know, your uniform is, you know, this white clothing or whatever. And uh, the first belt you get is a white belt just, to, you know, kind of hold your clothes up, you know. And so I go in there. And so, you know. Because I've been practicing in the park, Eastover Park, I want to I want to try out for you know the black belt. You got all of these belts, you know, levels, categories before you get to the black belt. And uh, man, I discovered uh, what I did was I just took my white belt off. <laughs> I had hit that floor too many times. Lord have mercy. And I just start getting, you know, you know, a young boy, young kid, I'm trying to figure out karate, you know, and uh, I just, I had hit the floor too much. And I'm just saying, why you treat me like this? Well, you said you wanted to be a black belt. Well, all I'm suggesting <laughs> is that you can't play with this stuff. <laughs> this is not a season <laughs> to play karate kid. Lord have mercy. Uh, Mr. Miyake, Lord have mercy, he's a character <laughs> in the movie, you know. And so I'm just saying that in this season, you need a master teacher. <laughs> Somebody that's going to be patient with you, that's going to help walk you through this process. Somebody ought to hear me, Lord have mercy. Come on, you know, you, you need somebody to walk. And so... God said, you got to release this word. Somebody has to make us consciously aware of the thoughts that God has for us. And sometimes as a preacher, as a pastor, we take a big hit because people don't want to hear that kind of word. You just, you know, want me to shout with you on Sunday, shout with you on Monday, shout with you on Wednesday. When are we going to get some truth? that we can walk to when we get through shouting. Because when you come down, you got to walk. When you get through praising, you got to walk. You got to get back to dealing with life in the practice. And so I want to encourage you today. This word is just so powerful. And I believe that if you follow the precepts and the examples that are found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses we read, literally verses 11 through 18 tonight will be a blessing. Take time out, meditate on the scripture, take a look at the word of God personally, even after this time of Bible study, use it as a devotion, a meditation, and watch what God does because uh, what we want is that we want people to glorify our God because they look at our lives and they see him. And so I want to thank you. I pray God for you that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I really believe that he's going to make his face to shine upon you. He's going to be gracious to you, but that the Lord is going to bless you with peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. God bless you until we meet next time.